Okay, so I'm joined by a very, very special guest today. For me, this is sort of like completing the jigsaw puzzle because I've interviewed uh, Matt Dixon, obviously, who's your co-author of the brilliant book, The Challenge of Sale, but I'm joined by the fantastic Brent Addison. So Brent, thank you so much uh, for giving me the time to talk to you today. Happy to be here, Aaron. It's great to be here. This is, you know, I kind of think of the word like Pokemon. You got to catch them all. So there you go. <laughs> exactly right. Well, why don't we start by anyone who's been sort of living under a rock or uh, has spent no time learning about the discipline of sales and selling and, and obviously, you know, the, the wonderful stuff that you've done. Why don't you start by giving us a kind of whistle stop tour of obviously who you are and the work that you've done and what you're doing now? Um, sure. So uh, for those who have bumped into it at some point in your sales career or marketing career. Um, I was part of the team that put together the work around uh, the research that became the book, The Challenger Sale, and the one after that, The Challenger Customer. That all happened at a company called Corporate Executive Board, which then became CEB, which then about five years ago was acquired by Gartner. Um, I worked in the sales and marketing practices there for about 19 years, um, uh, doing research and working with chief sales officers, senior executives around the world, just trying to understand what does world-class B2B selling and then ultimately marketing and then finally, ultimately customer service at the back end. Um, what does world-class look like and how do we learn from other companies? How do we learn from research, from data and put it all together in a story that's compelling and gets people excited to do something different? Um, before that, just as a footnote, uh, different podcast, different time, Aaron, but I was actually a German professor and a linguist at Michigan State University. So I don't, but all you put all together, I have a 30-year career so far uh, of uh I research stuff and I teach stuff. So I, I like to create knowledge and share knowledge is what I like to do. And in the last 20 years, that's been largely around B2B commerce. The, uh, I just recently left Gartner uh, just a couple of months ago and have joined a, a small uh, software as a service company because every company now is a SaaS company. But the, uh, it's called Ecosystems. It's a very cool company. We could talk a little bit about this if you want, but it's uh, Ecosystems is a software platform that helps uh, sellers and buyers um, identify together collaboratively the dimensions of value along which they want to measure a relationship and then track those dimensions of value over time, thus, you know, increasing likelihood of renewal, expansion, things like that. Um, it's taken me into a very interesting world that's adjacent to sales and success, which is called value management, which I gotta be totally honest, I, I, I knew of, I knew it existed, but it's it's actually like a, not only a very large thing, but it's a rapidly increasing thing. So Value, watch value management. That's coming over there. You remember like six years ago, customer success came out of nowhere, it felt like. That's value management right now. Keep an eye out for that. But that's my, that's my thumbnail sketch. I'd like to talk a bit more about that later because- Yeah, 100%. What you're saying is it's really consistent with the conversations I've had with Professor Rackham, who obviously wrote the, the forward to, to your book, The Challenger Sale, and, and obviously where, where the future of selling eventually lies. And yeah. it's very interesting what you're saying there because of the depth of knowledge that, that, uh, that customers now have and how late they're interacting with the, yeah. the vendor in the process. And then when eventually they're doing business, what value looks like and what the edges of value looks like. I'm really interested to talk more about that. Cool. Yeah, so let's do that. Let's go, let's go start with the book, right? So okay. the, the, the challenger sale was, was groundbreaking um, and obviously paved the way for other books that you guys have written and created a common vernacular and language for the other books as well. Yeah. But, but why don't you just give us kind of, and obviously it's a very rich book that talks a lot about a lot of data that you guys have sifted through and extrapolated interesting information out but why don't you tell us what the central thesis of the challenger cell actually is well it, it, keep in mind the the original research that led to the book uh was conducted in late 2008 2009 the book came out a couple of years later so this body of research has been around for gosh what is that 12 years 13 it's hard to believe it's been, a, it's been a while it's a long time i say that only because if you'd like to once i'll get this on the table then we can kind of talk about what sort of how at least my thinking has evolved from that not 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 um away from it but beyond it's probably a better way to put it but the uh the the research we started conducting back in uh, you know the two thousand eight nine uh, time uh, showing you know global financial crisis it was a mess we lay all this out in the books so I won't rehash it here but basically what we we're trying to understand is what sets the very best sales professionals apart from everyone else we studied that on a level of activities behaviors knowledge uh, perspectives things that you could do something about so there's some as you know there's some hugely interesting work out in the world around you know personality profiles. Uh, you know, innate characteristics. We don't want to study that because then it just becomes a hiring story. It's like, you know, are you more charismatic? And it's like, mm, I need to know what like, people actually do and how, because if I can know that, then I can help them do things differently, perhaps. Um, out of that work, we, we found these um, five different ways and uh, sort of clusters of activities and perspectives and knowledge that, that sales professionals have a tendency to gravitate towards, one of, one of five, um, as we call those the sales profiles. So there's a hard worker, relationship builder, challenger, and so on. And, and so there's two punchlines that came out of that work, I think. The one was the fact that the challenger rep, 
obviously maybe from the title is the one most likely to win. And, and I think crucial there is to understand what exactly challenger reps are doing. So we come back to that. And then the other big finding came out of the work was the fact that there's this individual that or this profile and which we termed somewhat controversially, the relationship builder who is least likely to win, not most likely to lose, that's overstating it, but least likely to be a star performer, um, which led to this rather um, um, animated discourse uh, and right around that time around, do relationships matter in sales? Um, our argument was always relationships crucially matter, but if your relationship is largely based on building familiarity with your customers and personal and professional relationships and knowing where they went to college and all that kind of stuff that felt right in the 80s, maybe 90s, and certainly in the 70s, there's martinis involved back then too, I think. Um, but the, uh, that, that just wasn't going to cut it anymore. It's not because, because your customers aren't looking for personal relationships as part of a sales interaction. It, we're all human. We love human interactions and relationships. But if you're going to convince a company, particularly a buying group that's increasingly large and complex and confused uh, to buy a multi-million dollar solution, um, whether or not you know where my kids went to college is just nowhere sufficient to get them to overcome the obstacles of that buying decision. Rather, what you have to do is challenge your thinking with, a, with an insight, an idea that helps them understand their business better than they understand it themselves. New way to make money, save money, mitigate risk that they haven't fully anticipated. And we've all been talking about like be value, be, be valuable to your customers, be trusted to your customers. And it turns out one of the best ways to establish value for your customers and establish trust isn't familiarity per se. It's, it's helping them understand their business better than they can understand it themselves. And so we call that challenging, not challenging them personally. That's where the other thing gets off the rails. Like, don't be so like Matt always jokes about. We didn't call it the jerk, right? It's like it's not challenging. Like seriously, Brent, you wore that shirt today. What? You know, it's it's not that. That's just insulting, right? So it's rather it's challenging their mental model, challenging their thinking, showing, helping them discover ideally collaboratively where the gaps are in their uh, in the way that they're constructing a model of how they think their business runs, and showing them new ways to to do that better. Yeah, it's really interesting, right? And 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 what I find fascinating about the challenge of sale is that. No, nothing that you describe in there is is groundbreaking, and I mean that in the nicest. Thank possible you. Way. <laughs> I get you. I, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you, man. Yep. But yeah. what I mean is, is what what you did really, really well is you put a language, yeah, and uh, you, you labeled something that had never really been defined before. I always say it's yeah. a bit like the kind of um, the, the baseline to smoke on water by Deep Purple. It's like it's really simple, but someone had to do it in the first place, right? And it's like yeah. it's really obvious, right? And, and what, what, I, what I found fascinating about that is that um, when you understand it, you can then learn how to model it. And, and, and ultimately, what you're saying is, is that you're, you're going in there and you're creating an environment where you're the expert, you're taking the customer on the journey collaboratively, you're becoming a trusted advisor, you're putting the customer's interests at heart, they're actually learning something in the process. When you boil that down, when companies are in a position to do that, they'll pay millions for a consultant to come in and do that. They That's right. They'll pay millions for someone to come in and go, tell us what we don't know. But yeah. what you did is you, you, you said to the salesperson, your job is to educate the customer. They need to go through this process in the very first place. So when you, when you, when you released the book, were you surprised by the reaction of the industry? Because you did kind of tip sales on its head to a degree in, in my perspective and certainly from the anecdotes that we hear in the market. Yeah. So when, so when we first, um, this is like the history of sales for those who would like, you know, the sales as a profession, um, this is kind of fun stuff, right? So, um, we, we first ran into Neil Rackham, the author of Spend Selling when we found him on YouTube, uh, presenting our research. Um, and we thought, well, Neil must like this. It's actually cool. Neil Rackham's talking about our research. So we actually gave him a call and he said, you know, let's meet. He, strangely enough, lives about five miles from where I'm sitting right now, which is my home. He lives over that way. In a, in, in, uh, and so we were all pretty close together. So we got together and sat down and, and talked about the work. And, um, you know, one of the things, and we talked about writing a book, and one of the things that Neil told me, uh, told us, because Matt was there as well, he said, what you guys don't understand, because he, he knew what we had, I think. He knew that this was a big deal. And, and he was very excited about it, which is super cool. He's a great guy. Um, and he said, this thing's going to last longer than you realize. In other words, you're going to write a book, it's going to sell some copies, and you're going to move on, and this thing's still going to be out there. And here we are 11 years later, and he was bang on right. I mean, I still get, it's, it's humbling, I'll tell you, but emails almost daily, or at least weekly, from someone who's picked up the book or you know, installed it in their organization saying thank you. And it's like, 
I, I, it's funny because I've kind of moved on. <laughs> I mean, I still believe the work, but it's a, it's a, it, but it's it's fun watching people encounter Challenger for the first time and see the see the the, the IP, the ideas, the insight through their eyes uh, because it's a, it's it's really a, a powerful thing. But as you can imagine, um, when we first released it, there was a lot. You know, I tend to go pretty aggressively against mental models. So, so for what it's worth, Challenger is very autobiographical. It's how I think personally. It's how we do our work or did our work at CEB back in the day. If you read the second book, The Challenger Customer, we put it in the context of how to create commercial insight for your customers, which is what it is. But what it actually is, is a step-by-step -step recipe book for how we used to create insight at the corporate executive board. Uh, it's, it was a lot of inside baseball in that book. Um, and the whole idea is this, I, this, this process of creating a mental model and then asking, you know, what does your customer, what did they miss? What did they overlook? So build the mental model and find gaps in the mental model. So there's actually, so th let me bear with me. So I'll tell you this briefly. I'll explain this briefly because it's actually instructive what the lesson of the book is actually about is how we went about telling the story. So as I like to say, Aaron, um, if you're going to change the way your customer thinks about their business, what's the first thing you have to know? What do you think? If, you, if I'm going to change the way my customer thinks about their business, what's the first thing you have to understand? If I'm going to change the way that, that our customers think about their business, um, I, my, my perspective would be to let them know the things they don't know can happen if they don't address certain issues. Okay, that's where you would, that's your outcome. I'm going to play with this. I won't, I won't, I, I won't let's leg this out too much, I promise. But that's the outcome you're ultimately trying to achieve, right? Okay, but yeah, so if I'm going to change the way, I'm going to, repeat. I'm going to just keep repeating the damn question. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so unhelpful. But if I'm going to change the so so that's what I want to accomplish. I want to accomplish changing the way my customer thinks about their business by reframing the things. But if I'm going to do that, Take me back to the beginning of the process. If I'm going to change the way a customer thinks about their business, what is the very first thing I need to understand? I need to understand how they think about their business currently. Thank you. That is exactly right. Now, when I ask, but it seems obvious when you say it out loud, say, oh, yeah, right. But here's what most people say. And I would imagine the, you know, the three people listening would say, if I'm going to change, <laughs> sorry, that was on me, not on you, man. The, uh, but if I'm going to say, oh, Brent's here, I could skip this one. But anyway, so the, if I'm going to change the way my customer thinks about their business, first thing I need to understand is most people, because I've done this all over the world, they'll say, well, I got to understand their business. If I'm going to change the way they think about their business, I got to understand their business. And, and, but notice the way you said it is actually different. You said, first thing I need to understand is how they think about their business. Now, why that matters, because it sounds simplistic, but practically speaking, they're two very different things. If I want to understand their business, what do I do? I go to Google or you know, search engine. I read their re annual reports. I read their, ten, their filings and you know, analyst reviews, all that kind of stuff. If I want to understand how they think about their business, I got to get inside their head. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? That's yeah. not on a Google search document, right? This is effectively, I would consider this a form at least that we could debate this in some other call maybe of empathy. I've got to under, I've got to put myself in their shoes and see their perspective or their, their business from their perspective and understand how they think about it, how they visualize it. The whole challenger body of work is built on this very simple concept of empathy, of getting inside someone's head figuratively, and understanding how they see their world. That's the mental model exercise that we lay out in the Challenger customer, which is the, the blue one back here, the book number two. Because the idea is if I can understand how someone thinks about their business, then I can start asking really interesting questions like, what did they miss? What did they yeah. overlook? What's a, what's a causal chain that they've underappreciated? What's a, what's a connection that they, they have fully uh, misunderstood? I can help them think about their business in a different way. Now, why all that matters, going all the way back to your original question, when we originally came out with the Challenger sale, that's what we did. We literally applied that process. We built what we call a uh, we call it so we called our clients back then members because you were members of the corporate executive board. So we called it not the mental model, but the member model. It is literally a map of how they think about their business. And huge, like a huge, bright, shining, blinking light on that mental model was relationships really matter. Mm. And so that's what we went after is okay, relationships, do they matter? What, for that matter, what is a relationship? even mean. So, so when you do this though, and this is, I think one of the core aspects of challenge, it's either really fun or really terrifying is when you build mental models and then break mental models. So you're frame breaking. Um, you gotta, you gotta bring your game. Do you know what I'm saying? First of all, you have to get that mental model accurate. So when you say, I gotta, I gotta understand the way they think about their business, that has to be accurate. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're going to be pushing against a model that they don't accept. Right. Mm -hmm. If I say, here's what you're doing wrong. It's like, I'm not doing that. Or like, that's not even my business you're describing. So you have to nail that. And that's so critical. So I've got to understand how, if I'm going to change the way they think about their business, I got to get that right. And then if you're going to change it, 
you got to be willing to get you got to challenge your thinking right you've got to engage in, in a debate and the the bigger the change that you're you're suggesting the higher the burden of proof so mm -hmm. if i'm going to say if i'm going to break this model we call this breaking the a and building the b and the challenger customer we lay all this out yeah. but if i'm going to break an a at a higher level i may say in other words if the change i'm suggesting is small the burden of proof is relatively low yeah but if the if the change i'm suggesting is large the burden of proof is frankly pretty hi right so so challenger the challenger sale i'm telling you that relationships don't matter in sales it's not actually what we're saying we got big debates but the language is provocative on purpose to be fair but but the traditional way we think about relationships is not the best way to sell um that that's a pretty provocative statement and the only way that you're going to knock someone off that that perspective is to have there's a, a very high burden of proof. You got to bring data to the table. You got to bring research. And every time I talk to, at least back in the day, about to senior leaders about the challenger sale and why it, why it took off the way it did, is it, it's always the same answer. And they said they'll tell me it's like it's because you had data. It's because you guys yeah. did the research. So yeah. we actually were able. To, and I think more than anything else, that's why it took off is because we met the burden of proof on a very disruptive idea. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of mentioned this before, and, and you know, I've spoken to yourself. I've spoken to Professor Rackham, and I've spoken to Matt and actually I've spoken yeah. to a gentleman called Chris Voss who's also responsible for yep. one of the sort of game changing uh books that's sort of you know change the way people think about sales and yeah you've all got one thing in common which is you're not salespeople. Yeah um, <laughs> for better for worse. Yeah but, I'm a German but, professor dude. <laughs> yeah, but, but, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting right that 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 yeah. for me is really interesting. I think I think I think I honestly think sometimes sales is um I think we poison our own well sometimes in selling and it takes someone from outside of our industry to actually go, well, let's analyze what's really happening. But to the point you were making before, um, yeah. and I guess let's, let's challenge these ideas then. Right. Okay. Um, sorry to, to, to obviously, you know, be meta to the, uh, to the conversation, but I guess the, the criticism of the challenger sound and um, where people go wrong in my, my yeah. perspective is that, what you're describing is an organizational capability. You're not describing yeah. one person turning around and going, I know you challenge yourself. It needs to be deeply ingrained in the DNA of the organization. It needs to be a strategic objective and a, a, a strategic choice in how we're now yeah. going to sell. And I yeah. think that the way that businesses often tackle that is they go, well, let's buy 10 copies of the challenge yourself and give it to our sales organization. And yeah. uh, we've, done, we've done that now, right? Yeah. Um, so, so, so how, how do you, I mean, obviously, I guess, and again, sorry, I'm going on a bit of a, a, bit of a rant here, but I guess it's what we do, quite, man, yeah, it's yeah, all good, yeah. but it, but it helps me sort of steel man, I suppose. But is that why you sold it as a concept to, to CB and then eventually Ghana? Was it Ghana and then CB? I can't remember which way around. Is so, that, so sold that as, a, as an idea and as a framework and as a kind of a way of bringing it into organizations. So, all right. So to give you some context, um, so the work we did it with people ask me all the time. In fact, early on, they asked me a lot. Is this a sales methodology? My answer emphatically was no, it's, it's, it's research. That's what it is. You know, is it, I never intended really to become a methodology per se. I think a lot of people would argue today that it is, which then begs the question, what, what exactly do we mean by the term methodology? But that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but the, um, so the, the research was conducted that literally that was the product at CEB. It's like we we work with chief sales officers, work with chief sales officers around the world to understand their biggest challenges. And then we do research to help them solve those challenges. The big challenge every year is no one's freaking selling. What do we do about that? Right. So that's so the there's there was back then a, a pretty long standing tradition at corporate executive board across sale because we had research teams just like this for sales, marketing, you know, HR. So and all that's been acquired by Gartner. So it still exists. But the uh, there's a long history of like building if I may, pretty world-class insights across all these functions and putting them out in the world and saying, and then at that point, we're like, we did our job. You wanted research. We got your research. And then small boutique uh, consulting companies would rise up and say, I could totally monetize that. And they'd build these little companies, which become some, became sometimes big companies around things like employee engagement research we'd done. And so a challenger, there was a, there was a kind of like a, a moment across the leadership team of the company, which is above me. Cause remember I, I was just in the sales practice of this bigger machine, but there's like, you know, it'd be kind of nice if we were the ones that got paid for all this. Like if, you know, it's if companies are going to go out and install all this research, maybe we create a effectively a, a consulting or, a, or a, an implementation company around this. That became 
uh, the Challenger Training Group, what we call the Solutions Group at CEB, which then, be, of course, became part of Gartner. And then Gartner spun it off into it because they said, we're not in the training business. So let's take this actually really high quality team and spin it off. And now that is the Challenger company, a lot of whom are still you know, very good friends of mine. Um, for what is no one really cares about this stuff, Aaron, but just briefly, because of the way this worked, it's, it's, it was always CEB IP, then Gartner IP, now Challenger IP. It was never my IP. Uh, I never made, nor did Matt. Um, royalties off the book, um, which, by the way, is millions of dollars, um, because it was all, and that's okay, you know, that because that went to the company, not to us individually. And and so uh, I say that not because of always me. I, I knew what I was signing up for. I'm totally fine with it, um, but because it's your point about research, because that's what it was always about for us. It wasn't about selling a methodology. It wasn't about trying to monetize an idea. Although on the back end, the company chose it. For Matt and I, Matt and me, it was and and our teams. It was about how do we just understand the world better and put research out there that's hopefully materially helpful because that's ultimately what we were selling and, and just kind of how we're wired. It's, uh, and so that's why I'm so proud of not just the Challenger work, but sort of my relationship to it is yeah. as a researcher. My relationship to it is as a researcher, as someone just trying to help us all understand really complex ideas. That's really profound. I like that. I like that a lot. And um, this, does it frustrate you that um, it became... I'm trying to think of the best way of phrasing this because I don't like cynicism, but sometimes people are cynical about it. Is that yeah? It, it, it it's a great book. It's what well, it's an incredible book, and the yeah. research is, is and to Neil's point, the research is is you know it's it's completely changed the way people look at selling, like genuinely. And I and I think the timing of it was perfect. What was going on the ground? Yeah, I, it's lightning in a bottle. I agree. It's yeah. it's you know even like you look at like what Matt's doing now, the work I'm doing now, it's with the jolt effect coming up from Matt, I mean, we'll never capture the challenger sale magic again. Not to say that it's not quality work. It's really great stuff he's doing now and the stuff I'm doing now is super cool. But man, talk about the right place, the right time with the right message. We just, it just, I don't know if we nailed it or just got freaking lucky. I think it's a little bit of both, but yeah. yeah I would have thought so. Well, but then again, yeah. you, you make your own luck in this world, right? I mean- That's you, fair, yeah. yeah. So yeah, does it does it frustrate you that it's now become a, um, it's now become a, a, a way of, of, of an organization going in there and selling off the back of the research and selling off the back of the book, or, or you just see that as being natural progression of writing great research. It's probably almost inevitable. So I, I don't have no, I, and keep in mind, and I'll be careful here because again, the Challenger company is a great company. Again, these are a lot of my friends, but Jen Allen's a dear friend of mine. I've known her for 15 years. Um, you know, Spence Wixom, you know, a lot of I won't list names that no one's heard of, but you know, the, uh, there's a lot of great people over there and I have no, um, I, 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 wow, well, I'm speaking German in my head now. It's like, I, I have, I have no regret or no, I don't feel like, what the heck guys, you're making money off this. That, that's, it just is what it is. Um, I think though, that they would be the first to argue the same thing I would argue, which is what does bum me out a little bit is that companies have come to see it as a quote unquote sales methodology, which to your point is it's not really, it was never meant to be a sales methodology. It can kind of be one. And the, the, the team at Challenger would help you figure that out, I'm sure. But I think of it as a commercial strategy. It's a way to approach the market. It's a way to think about how you engage with customers. For me personally, it's a way to think about how you just engage with others full stop around insight. Um, so I think in some ways, when one calls it a methodology, it gets shrunk down to something that's um, tactical, which to be fair, Aaron, I think is you kind of have to, because you know it's one thing as a researcher to create these big ideas, but if I'm a chief, if I'm a head of sales enablement, right? And, I've, and I'm supposed to install Challenger. I don't want to know what the researcher wonk says. I want to know, like, what am I supposed to do on Monday morning? Am I, do I build a template? Am I supposed to roll this out into training? How do I turn into brass tacks that a sales rep can use? So I totally appreciate that point. So there's a, um, uh, there's a strong tendency to want to, to scope it down to something I get my hands around and install. And I think that's critical. And I, I have come to learn you know, my, my training is just like Matt's is over, the, you know, originally was an academic. I've, my PhD is in linguistics. And so I've, you know, I live in this world of big ideas, but I've come over the last 19 years to deeply appreciate that no, no big idea is valuable unless you can actually freaking go do something with it. Uh, but in, in your efforts to go do something with, sometimes that idea has to morph or has to get resized or reshaped uh, to, to be practical. And and that's that's why I like the application of research so much more. So all that's to say is like, I'm good with it. <laughs> I, I've learned to live with it, Aaron. It's it's all good, man. <laughs> yeah, again, I'm, 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 I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to be uh, like a polemicist or, or even trying to. No, like, I get like, it. Yeah, I'm I'm just interested, right? Because yeah, um, the reason I'm interested, the two reasons. Number one is that um, 
I, w- I was that sales enablement lead. I, I, I've right. run sales enablement leads for huge organizations, right? Huge organizations, yeah. um, global organizations. And you can't just go and put Challenger in there. I, I can't right. turn up and go, right, okay, let's, let's do Challenger now. It has to become yeah. an organizational capability, right? Um, and my worry is, is that the barrier, yeah. to entry can, barrier to entry can be um, can be difficult, right? It, it's high. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, let me, I'll t- a couple notes on that. So, so again, to be fair to us and you know, to fair to the words, I would just acknowledge the point right up front. Um, when we originally created this work, we weren't thinking like that. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. again, we were researchers saying like, what's right answer look like based on what we're seeing in the data? And then only afterwards did we back solve for, oh, bleep, how does a company actually do this, right? So it's, you know, I think if we had solved for like, what can a company do right now and started the project there, we probably would have come out with a very different kind of idea, uh, which is an interesting sort of thought exercise to go through. But but nonetheless, I, I have learned I mean, what you're talking about is, if I may, uh, all singing, all dancing challenge, like the full schlamazel, like how do I roll this whole thing out in its purest form to have the highest level of impact? And I get it. And I, you're 100% right. That's a that's not even sales and marketing. That's a commercial function, arguably going all the way up to the CE, senior leadership buy-in. Product development probably needs to be involved in that. You got to research teams, building commercial insight, building models, breaking models, uh, uh, and then helping equip reps and then figuring out your content strategy and how can I do this with reps, without reps, or digital. Whoa, right? I mean, it's it's like your head explodes. It, you know, and I can't tell you how many times over the years I've gone up on stage at sales kickoffs. You know, whether it's in London or you know Orlando in the U.S. is always in Orlando or Scottsdale, but the uh, um, you know, and, and present a challenger. And when, and it's usually the head of sales enablement or head of sales or the, or the head of sales, the chief sales officer would invite me in to get me up on stage to present the challenger work. And it was interesting, Aaron, it would always go one of two ways. So, you know, as you, as you kind of notice, we, we talk about challenger as either, not either, as both an individual skill and an organizational capability. And the first thing I would do before I said, and I learned this the hard way, I said, uh, I would always tell that head of sales before I get up on stage and, you know, do my rah-rah and get people hopefully really excited about Challenger because that's what I get paid to do then. Um, are you ready for it? Like, so there would be an organizational readiness conversation. So is your senior senior leadership team bought into this? Are your first line sales managers ready to coach to it? And we'd, we'd go through this check because I think that's critical. Um, but sometimes it would say, Brent, yeah, we're going to do that. Now, is, is your marketing team ready to build insights? Does your marketing team know what insight is? Are they ready to figure out what this looks like in a digital set? That's all this stuff you got to think about. And sometimes they say, you're right, Brent. We got to sit that, that, sit down, put that together, put a plan in place. And we got to figure out how to make this an organizational strategy. And I want you to talk about, and so they would encourage me to get up on stage and say, here's what marketing's going to do to make this work. Here's what sales enablement's going to do. And they want to tell the whole organizational story. Sometimes, however, heads of sales would say, Brent, I get it. I think that's important, but we're not going to do that right now. You know, that's that's a six month to a 12 month journey. You've been here, right? That's yeah. going to take a lot of time to set all that up. Uh, this meeting is in two weeks in Orlando. I want you to get up on stage and you can say that and acknowledge it. But I also want you to win the hearts and minds of the people in the room that there's something that they as individuals can do differently right now. Yeah. And and I think that's a fair point. You know what I mean? It's like, it, because the, these big organizational shifts take time and it, and it's very easy to say then therefore it's not my problem or I'll just wait till corporate gives me something new to say but I do think there's something very valuable and important at the heart and soul of challenger that is a story about what individuals can do differently yeah. if just if nothing else in their mindset and how they approach customers no, I really like that and then um, you know I, 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 own, I own my own uh, SaaS excellence consultancy now right and yeah one of the questions we ask with any change, and you, you've hit the nail on the head, right, is that is everyone aligned that this is a problem that needs solving? Are there any other priorities that, that are, 100%. Are, are taking it above this? And look, ultimately, like, is everyone actually convinced that this is the answer to the problem? Right. I love the yeah. way you do that. And I agree. I think I think someone can read the book and actually take some valuable lessons they can put into their, their sales game, if you will, and yeah. start getting on straight away as well. I guess I was just trying to separate out the research in the book from what became the product at the end. I think, I think we've spent enough time on that now. Yeah. It's been really valuable to learn that. I, th- I actually wanted to sort of look forward now a little bit, if that's okay yeah. with you, is that, you know, it, as you said, it's been, I think it's been 11 years since the book was, was published. Um, yeah. And funnily enough, I think, I think something like the pandemic or the, the actually increased the relevance of, of ch- the Challenger Cell, right? Uh, it, it, I think that's right. Yeah, it made it even more pertinent versus the global financial crisis. Actually, yeah. in some ways, but how how has your how has your thinking evolved since the book's been published, and obviously since you've seen the reaction of the book as well? 
so um so there's there's thinking like there's recent thinking there's really really recent thinking let me do the recent thinking first which and i'll do this briefly and we can dig in if you like but um uh, the work that I was involved in with the, with the team at Gartner's, because we kept researching, right? We, we kept studying things. And right up until I departed, um, one of the big ideas that we were studying is this concept called sense-making, which is in HBR. We can link it or you, know, you can find us by searching uh, sense-making for sales, HBR, throw my name on there, Adamson, it should pop right up. Um, but um, and so let me tell you a little bit about sense-making. And then I can tell you a little bit about where I think all this takes us going forward. But the uh, the world we live in today is radically different than the world we lived in 10 years ago, specifically with a view towards information. So, so yes, we lived even 10, 12 years ago in a world that was moving rapidly to digital, already moved rapidly to digital. And there's a lot of information out there. We talk about the big blue arrow, I guess, technically it's gray and the challenger customer. So we didn't publish in color, but the, uh, um, but you know, the, 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 that arrow is a depiction of the fact that customers were relatively deep into a customer buying journey before they'd ever pick up the phone or fire up the email, reach out to a supplier sales rep to get their input on whatever they were doing. They learn on their own. Um, that story for the most of the years following challenger sale was a story of customers learning on their own. And their, their job was, or their, their task was essentially to separate signal from noise or wheat from chaff. It's like, there's a lot of information out there. I'm going to learn on my own. And my job is to figure out which of that information matters. What's the good information? What am I going to pay attention to? What am I going to believe? And then I'm going to make up my mind and I'm going to have it all decided. And then I'm going to call up a sales rep and say, here's what I want. Here's how much I'm willing to pay. Um, you know, the uh, one of the heads of sales I know really well, his name's Kevin. He said, you know, we are, this whole dynamic, when I described to him, he says, we are on a freight train to commodity station. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's kind of how this all plays out. And, and so that's, we hit this idea, this theme really hard in the opening of the challenge your customer, what it means when your customers can learn on their own. Fast forward to today, here's what's happened. And I find this really fascinating. So you've been part of this, right? And many of your listeners, all three of them have been part of it. I'm sorry, it's again, me, not you. The, uh, uh, the uh, it's like, oh, it's the Brent episode, skip it. But the, uh, but the, um, the thing that happens, uh, this is a whole nother article I need to write. But the, the thing that happened around 2015, and you were there for this, right, is that, so first of all, what happened was customers were struggling to differentiate on their products. There were fast followers. There was easily replicable products. Um, this is actually repeating itself now in the SaaS world with product-led growth. But everyone's like, I'm going to compete on a product. And over time, bigger enterprise companies realize that doesn't work because people can just you know, uh, replicate the product. So then we moved into this world of solution selling. So I'm going to have, I'm going to put products together. I'm going to bundle them in interesting ways. I'm going to wrap services around them. I'm going to differentiate because one plus one plus one equals four. And I can offer differentiated value because I'm offering you not just products, but a solution. And so we moved into this world of solution selling. And a lot of our, this is where we kind of picked up story. A lot of our work is about solution selling. Over time, that kind of played out. And this is what we captured in the challenger sale. This is where we captured the wave, which is as companies were building out their solutions, lo and behold, so were their competitors, right? So now it's not just I'm competing my product versus your product. Now I'm competing my solution versus your solution. And we're still freaking commoditized. I mean, look at FedEx versus UPS, right? World-class solutions, but they go head to head on literally every aspect of those world-class solutions. So it's still a really hard place to differentiate. So somewhere around 2015, and this is where like the, uh, the language in the challenger sale, if it's not what you sell, but how you sell is the biggest opportunity for differentiation, it's not your product, but the way you approach customers. And that's when the moment hit because shortly or thereafter, right about that time, companies struggling with this opportunity to differentiate themselves, whether they read the challenger sale or not, kind of came to the same conclusion and said, we need a new way to differentiate ourselves. We need a new way to stand out the market. If it's not a product, if it's not a solution, what is it? I know what it is. We're going to be smart. We're going to demonstrate to our customers that we are the smartest kid on the block. And we're going to do that through something. Wait for it, Aaron. Here it comes. We're going to do that through something called thought leadership. Right. So we all got on the thought leadership bandwagon, a bandwagon, which by, but I will tell you, by the way, is still just like full speed ahead, barreling down the street today. I mean, that stuff on thought leadership is everywhere. Right. But the whole idea is if we can demonstrate to our customers that we have better things to say, smarter things to say, they'll come to us first to help to get help with their mission critical priorities. We're going to brand ourselves around being progressive thinkers. That's the that is, those are the waters into which challenger sale waited. So the fact that this thing took off, I think that's as much a part of it as anything else is what we did is we gave people a recipe for how to be a thought leader. At that same time though, Aaron, you remember this? Everyone got on the bandwagon of content marketing, right? Yeah. So content marketing comes over the horizon. Oh my God, we're gonna differentiate ourselves by just creating inbound leads by putting out huge amounts of content. At the same time, marketing automation hit the scene Right. And at the same time, we're shortly thereafter, we all had more access to more data than ever before. What does that mean? Well, we essentially we all entered into a smartness arms race. 
right? Mm -hmm. So we're all like, we're going to build more content of higher quality than ever before. And so we're going to outsmart our competition. We're going to demonstrate to our customers that we're the best. So we're going to essentially spam the field with more insight than you can ever believe. And by the way, if you're on the challenger journey at this point, it's like, glory, hallelujah. I know how to do this better than anyone else. But even those people who are on the challenger journey still have better data. They got better tools. They've got better scale. They got better experts. And so not, so both the quantity and the quality of information went up rapidly over the last five years to the point now where we're at today is we live in a world that is just awash in massive amounts, not just of high quantity information, but high quantities of high quality information. And where that leaves customers is in a really bad place because if it used to be about separating signal from noise, I kind of live in a world now where it all feels like signal mm. and now I'm screwed, right? This is like, as I like to tell people, like the smartness arms race ended in a tie and the only one to lose is your customer. Yes, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a scripted line, but I love it now because I think that's what's happened because where customers are now is just overwhelmed. I don't, I don't know. It's like, I, I read your insight and it's got data. It's backed by experts. It tells me what to do. It's like, yes, I got to do that. But then I read someone else's research and thought leadership and they, they've got data and they've got experts and they've got research and they're telling me this company's telling me to zig. That company's telling me to zag. Now, bleep and bleep. I don't know what to do. You know what I better do? I better study this more. I better read this more. And then you just get even more confused. And I was presenting this concept in Palo Alto in the before times, before the pandemic, right before it. And there was a head of sales there said, yeah, but <laughs> it's so funny. He said, but Brent, I did what you told me to do. It's like, oh God, this never ends well when I hear this, right? He said, I adopted Challenger. So my, while all my competitors are out there saying you should go in this direction, I'm reframing and I'm out there saying you should go in that direction. So I'm good, right? I said, well, maybe, but if these people over here telling me to zig, have got a lot of really compelling, convincing data, and that's a great argument. It makes a ton of sense. And you're telling me to zag and you've got a great argument. You're compelling. And maybe they haven't met the challenger principles, but you have, right? Mm. It kind of doesn't matter from the customer perspective. It's like, it's all pretty good, convincing information. And I'm just confused. What I, what I need help with in this world, Aaron, is not yet another insight. Don't get, say, like, so in other words, by the way, so the, the answer can't be don't show up with insight. This can't be like, oh, forget all about that challenger stuff because no one's going to unilaterally disarm in a smartness arms race. That would actually be bad. Like I'll be the yeah. dumb company just doesn't work, right? So you still have to do that. But it tells me two things. The precision with which you do that has to be higher than ever before. And your ability to differentiate on that insight has to be higher than ever before. But at the same time, I think where customers really need help is not yet another insight, but provide one. But help me make sense out of all of this. Help me put it all together. Help me organize and analyze and prioritize this information such that not you tell me what to do, but such that I can make a decision on my own and feel more confident in that decision that I make. So this is a shift as I see it from frame breaking, which I still think is important to what I call frame making. And this, I think, is this is sort of my latest thinking in this world, pushing a lot of my research now and, and, and the work I'm involved in, is how I, I think our biggest opportunity today to differentiate ourselves as sellers isn't just to break frames, but to make frames. That is to provide our customers some means of organizing that information, of putting it together, analyzing it in such a way that they themselves can come to their conclusions and feel more confident about those conclusions in a way that leads them to take some sort of action other than status quo. You know, when the conversation you had with Matt around the jolt effect, he said, it's not that people are bought into the status quo, it's that they're afraid to change. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's like, yeah, we know we need to change, but holy bleep, I don't know what to do. I don't have the confidence to go forward yeah. because I'm so overwhelmed. That, that's my that's my spiel. I don't know what no, you no, think, no, you I buy get, any of that? Yeah, so so let, let, let me give you my perspective on it, right? Yeah, go ahead. I'd love to hear it. I, I think I think sales is fundamentally backwards. Right? <laughs> I do. I think, I think it's fundamentally backwards. Yeah. Right? So let, let me give you an example of this, right? Okay. Right. Let's say you're 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 a vendor. Sorry, sorry, you're 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 a, a whatever, a head of marketing, right? Yeah. You know you've got a problem that needs solving, right? Yeah. And there's one or two things that's going to happen. Someone has been pestering you for the last year and a half to do business with them, and they're trying yep. to educate you on their problem, and they're yep. trying to educate you on the solution to the problem. Or you're going to go to market and go, right, and they need to go and pick a vendor, right? Yeah. So the timing is now right for them to go and pick a vendor, or at least be educated on the problem. Yeah. Have. Now, sales organizations, organizations have this wonderful capability, which is salespeople. 
And what they're really good at, or should be really good at, is learning about the problem, educating the customer on the potential of not solving the problem and putting a solution yep. on them. Yeah. The problem is, is the customer can't be triaged to the salesperson. It's very hard for the for the prospective customer to be triaged to the salesperson at the right time. That's yeah. why I think a middleman is missing from sales. I think there needs to be a marketplace where vendors, sorry, where customers come on there and go, I'm looking for a vendor to first educate me on my problem. And then they get a series of, of they get a series of potential vendors and they turn around and go, let me come into your business and learn about your business. I'll spend a week doing it. I'll educate you on what else is happening in the market, educate you on what our potential customers have. And they pick four vendors to do that in their process. You've got yeah. the customer doing it at the right time, who's got the patience to actually go through a process of being educated. The, 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 the organization is going to invest in it because there could be a potential sale at the back of it. And then they get run through the customer's process, not a sales process. Yeah, I think that's fundamentally what's wrong is that we, we, we're trying to turn people who aren't ready to buy into someone who's going to buy. And we're ignoring there's a big group of people out there ready to buy and they can't make a decision based on all the white noise. That's yeah. why I think a middleman is, is fundamentally missing from sales. Couple of thoughts on that. These, uh, so first of all, the value of this middle person, I think, is high. I mean, just like I, the company I just left, Gartner, is effectively playing that role for a lot of companies, right? So we are we're an advisory company, just helping you sort of sort through all this and figure it out. It's a five billion dollar company that just doesn't sell anything other than that kind of help, which is crazy, right? Uh, and and they have competitors, Forrester, for example, um, and that's what we did at CEB as well. So so there's. Not only is there value in that, there's a huge amounts of value in that, as the marketplace has already dis- demonstrated. I think, by the way, just to be clear here too, uh, baby and bathwater. I, I and I don't think you're doing this either, Aaron. But the um, there is a baby still in the Challenger story. It's not all bathwater, like which let, yeah, let's not throw it out. Which is as part of that 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 the physics of what you just described is um, when when you get involved in those conversations, that's your opportunity. And say, now that I'm here to give you other, a different way to think about it, a different perspective, a different way to think about causal change. So, so let's, I think that's the core belief of Challenger. I, I still am wed to today that frame, there is still room and value for frame breaking. Let me throw something out and get your thoughts on this. So the, um, over the last six months, and this is why I'm at uh, Ecosystems now. So my, my role at Ecosystems is continue to do research and then build a customer community. So I'm the head of research and communities, but the logical title, I guess, based on that mandate. But the, uh, um, one of the things that's come over the horizon in the last six months, particularly in SaaS, but I think you're going to see it everywhere very soon, um, and it exploded onto my radar screen about six months ago, is three words, ecosystems, partnerships, and communities. And and, I, and so ecosystem, not the company I work for now, but just the concept of ecosystems more broadly. Uh, in fact, I'll be on a podcast next week called Partner Up, and it's all about the partner community. And so I think what's happening is, kind of to your point, um, particularly SaaS organizations have found these spamming you with BDR calls, whether it's cold calling or whatever it might be, it's just, it's just not working. As the, as the costs of that go up, as the denominator which you want to drive blitz growth you know, goes up and so it becomes harder and harder and you've now got a scorched earth problem because you've called everyone there is to call. I mean, CEB went down this road 15 years ago. I literally have been part of watching this happen. We wrote an article in HBR about it called Dismantling the Sales Machine. And today, SaaS is remantling the sales machine. So it's, it's really frustrating. I think though, as they've kind of come to the conclusion that there's like, this thing's got an endpoint. It's like, it plays out. Um, we need a new way to generate demand. We need a new way to create the very dynamic you just described. And so there's a really interesting focus now on customer communities and yeah. how can we create these ecosystems of customers, of partners working together to collectively identify, solve, uh, address, discuss uh, problems. And I think this becomes really interesting is a, is a new way to think about demand gen. Um, you know, it's just like Planet of the Apes. In some way or another, we're going to find a way to break it and blow it up and screw it all up. You know, but 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 for now, at least, I think there's a huge amount of potential here um, to to think about what what a community play would look like to do the yeah. very thing that you're talking about. I agree. I I, actually, I think that's a really good point. And and I think here's the thing, right? Is that customers, potential customers or prospects, it's easy to think that they're looking for a solution. This, this yeah. the, the, the mistake salespeople make. What they really want is I want someone to come and understand what my big problem is and actually yeah. help me understand it a little bit better. So then yeah. I can make a solution or not make a decision, which is even better. Yeah. So then I can go, well, I can solve this in-house. Yeah. And that's something that salespeople can do really, really effectively. Let me let me take that idea. And so I would I would go, I'll dig into it a little deeper if you were to root cause it. Um is um 
I don't know, actually, I'd ladder up to it. I guess not root cause, but the nonetheless is, I think what they're really looking for, if I may, and this is based on a lot of research we did at Gartner and, and I've worked on a little bit since is, I think what they're really looking for is just to feel confident in their, in the decision. It's like, I've told over the last year and a half, more heads of sales and marketing and CEOs this than ever is the, um, the single biggest opportunity, I think for all of us in sales and marketing right now is to put everything through the lens of customer confidence, but it's not confidence in you or your brand or your product. It's confidence in themselves and their ability to make a large scale decision on behalf of their company. So how can I, how can I help them feel like, yeah, we, we did look at the right information. We did ask the right questions. We have come to the right conclusion. I feel confident that we are all in alignment. I feel confident this is going to be right for our company. I feel confident the implementation is going to go well. That So everything you're talking about, I think, is ultimately solving for this underlying customer's perception of themselves. Because if I don't feel confident, I'm going to put it off. I'm going to mitigate risk by doing something smaller or, or, or studying it more. And, and what we're finding is in this world, it's become so fraught with information and confusion and, and buyer complexity. We haven't talked about the spaghetti bowl that you put on LinkedIn yesterday, right? The, the buying process, all the arrows going all yeah. over the place. Um, buying has become so fraught and so complex that what we're seeing effectively is like a crisis of confidence among customers, not in you or your product, but in their own ability to make a decent decision on behalf of their customers, uh, on behalf of their company. And, and if they don't feel confident in making those decisions, they're just not going to make them. So it's consistent, that, it's consistent yeah. with Matt's, Matt's uh, yeah. research in the job. Exactly. Right. That's really right. Um, but yeah. Let's not forget we created this problem though, right? We, we... Oh yeah, right. hundred percent. That's why it's so interesting. We did this to ourselves. But, I tell but, you, we, we blow up every it's planet of the apes there. And I'm telling you, man, we just ruin everything but, to touch. This, yeah. is, this is, this is what selling is, right? This yeah. is, this is what's so fascinating to me. And this is why I love the history of selling is that yeah. what we do is in sales is that we come up with something new and it's novel to the customer therefore it's yeah. valuable to the customer yeah and then it floods the market and then yeah. the customer and the prospect get desensitized to it and the market gets desensitized yeah. to it and then someone comes up with something new and then they go that's really cool yeah that's really interesting that's really valuable that's novel yeah and so it's a constant game of cat and mouse both strategically and tactically 100 percent that was organized that's right that's people. right. Um, but, but Aaron, notice we don't do this because we're salespeople or we're in the sales profession. We do this because we're human beings. Yeah, that yeah. that to me is, yeah, we do this with reality TV. We do this with music, right? We do this with clothing styles. I mean, it's like, it's literally just how humans work, which is why I geek out on this after 30 years, because my background is, is as a social scientist. I, I, I study people and how they work. And I just find this utterly fascinating, if not sometimes a little bit depressing, but the, uh, is, is this this constant dynamic of like, you build something, you find a new idea, you run it out, you know, it gets replicated, it gets commoditized, you got to move on to the next thing. It's a constant push yeah. for learning it. This is why all the research and just books and pundits in the last five years have not been wrong about, you know, open mindset and curiosity. And it's like, because because the world's going to freaking keep changing because it has to, because we're going to keep ruining the cool things we've already built. But that's a, but that's a good thing. I, don't, I say that cynically, but I mean, that is actually a good thing. We're like tripping up the stairs. You know what I mean? Is this maybe yeah, a way I to think, look at it? I think, yeah. it's, I think it's innately built in human nature. And I think that the innovation is innately built into human nature as well. Yeah. I think the need to innovate and to create new things and to have access to new things is something that's uniquely human. I think. Yeah. Um, well, it's partly because we take everything we've already created and I, I get this uh, and ruin it. I'm just a cranky old man today. No, but we find ways to, to commoditize it effectively. So it's no longer new. It's no longer differentiated. And in sales, as you know, as I've state the obvious, right? We all know that the story is differentiation. It's exactly yeah. what you just said. It's like, how can I stand out? And because anything that stands out is going to be replicated almost, I don't know, instantly, but quickly that we have to constantly push for that new innovation. And sometimes, and this is the lens that there's the other article I put in HBR in January that kind of blew up. I didn't title it, by the way, that was HBR. Although I love those guys. They said that's like sales and marketing is becoming obsolete. I don't know if you saw that one. It's like, I don't know if they're becoming obsolete. We could debate that one. It's a fun conversation. <laughs> but I think, I think to the degree that we apply a sales lens to this conversation or a marketing lens or a success lens, I think that's where we're going to go wrong because I think the best and newest innovations are going to be ones that work across those silo boundaries as opposed to live inside a specific function. No, I, I agree with you. I think I think fundamentally we're we're agreed. I think fundamentally yeah. we're agreed. But let's 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 bookend this conversation with something super super tactical, right? So yeah. I've got one of the game changers on on my podcast who's changed sales forever, who's obviously done a ton of research and has got really granular into the minutiae of that 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 research as well. Pretend I'm a new sales guy or gal who's just, yeah. just uh, you know, accepted a job as an SDR or an AE. What's the one piece of advice? And I don't want to oversimplify it. You can you can give as long an answer as you want. But what's the one <laughs> piece of advice you'd give 
to a new salesperson entering the environment and the ecosystem of selling now that you think yeah. is going to help them in their career both now and long term? By the way, let me ask you a question and, and, and all the listeners a question because I, I, I've got actually, I'll give you a couple ideas real quick, but I've got a number of answers to this and I think they might actually collect up into a book. Okay. And, and what I'm trying to figure out is would the world be interested in that? It's like, or like, am I the researcher? It's like, here's, a, here's this guy, Brent, who's just like his, it's like one more, it's kind of what you said about the pundits, like, here's my thoughts on sales. I don't know if there's an appetite or um, interest in this, but I, I just having lived in this world of sales for 17 years, been on more sales calls than he was like, I've never had a quota, but I've been like, I've been quota adjacent like 17 years. I've studied, there's a lot of research and, and, and so much of sales is just storytelling. Mm-hmm. And that's what I do. That's my expertise or my experience, at least is telling stories. And I've learned so much about that that I think is shared. So let me give you an example. So I think um, to your point, I call this the Thursday morning test. Like, so like Brent, brass tacks, it's Thursday morning, nine o'clock. I'm about to hop on the Zoom call with the customer. What do you want me to actually do? What do you want me to say? Like make it that level of tactical. Uh, and, and so I got a whole list of these things, but here's one that I like, I, I share often, which is, it, it is, it's consistent with this idea of frame making and sense making. Um, one of the ideas that comes out in that sense making work is um, there's a couple of approaches to information that don't work. So being a giving, so applying, a, 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 taking, a, adopting a giving approach to information. Here's information. Here's even more information. Stop doing that. The, the degree to which you just think your role of uh, that your role in sales, the way you provide value to your customers, is prov- is the provision of information. You're actually just exacerbating a problem rather than overcoming. I call that indiscriminate generosity. But likewise showing up and being what we call a telling rep, which is, I've been doing this for 30 years. Here's what you need to do. Turns out to be very ineffective as well, because in a world where I can fact check everything and I'm, I'm looking to cross check things, just having your opinion doesn't help me. It doesn't make me feel more confident in me. That's just like, I just, it could, confirms that you feel confident in you. That's all that really does. So this idea of sense making is I need to uh, fall back on social proof. What do other customers like me think? What have other people who've been on this journey, what have they done? What questions do they wish they'd asked sooner? Where do they run into trouble? What would they do differently if they had another chance? So super tactical, that's where we can play. So your role as a sales or one of your roles as a sales professional, one of our roles as a sales professional is less to tell customers our opinion or based on our experience, what they think we should do. Our, uh, the real opportunity, I think, for all of us in sales is to be a conduit of perspective, helpful perspective from other companies to our customer company. In other words, one of the things is, as you know this in your work, I'm sure, Aaron, is like the one thing every company wants to know is what do other companies like us do? Everybody wants, they, they say they want benchmarks, but nobody wants to give you data to create a benchmark, which is so freaking frustrating. But nonetheless, everybody wants benchmarks, right? So. So uh, let me boil it all. So all this is very high level stuff. You asked for something very tactical. It's, it comes down to a phrase. It's a phrase that I literally have built my career off of in the last 17 years. And it sounds something like this. In working with other customers like you, one of the things that we've been surprised to learn is, and then fill in the blank. And there's a lot packed into that statement. So this idea of in working with other customers like you, one of the things that we've been we've learned that really surprising is, is Notice what I'm doing there is I'm taking myself out of the position of being an expert and putting myself in the position of being like Switzerland. I'm neutral. My job here is just to, I'm a connector. I'm connecting you to the thing that you desperately want, which is information from other customers, which you don't have access to, but I do. That's my value is my access, not my expertise. And so I can show you what other companies like you are doing. Uh, so I think, first of all, that's important. The language is, in working with other customers like you, one of the things we've been surprised to learn, that, that word surprise, it doesn't have to be in there, but it's, it's a little extra grace note. It's like a chef's kiss, right? We didn't think this is easy. It's like, if I'm surprised by it, um, and by the way, I say this about challenge all the time. You know why I say I was surprised by challenge? Because we were surprised. You know what I mean? It was like, whoa, what? So I, it's, it, it shows that I'm on a learning journey. It shows that I'm curious. It shows that I'm open to new ideas. And I'm encouraging you to kind of adopt that same role of let's be curious together. Let's go. Let's look at this. And it, it gives you permission to ask questions, to, to kind of fight back. And so that we can collaboratively explore the boundaries of this idea, as opposed to me just saying, here's what you need to do, which shuts down conversation. But if you say curious, it opens up conversation. It opens up exploration, invite your customer into a conversation. And working with other customers like you, one of the things we were surprised to learn is, um, and then the other thing about surprise is, the other thing that I tell, uh, I've, I've trained our presenters for years on this at CEB, I tell people this all the time, is the thing in a sales call and any presentation of storytelling, there's, you're always solving for two things at the same time. What do I want my customers to know 
And that's what we always solve for. But the other thing is, what do I want my customers to feel? Do I want to? And, and if you go back and diagram the, the, the narrative or the, the choreography of a challenger pitch, you know, and then we've got that little diagram that goes like this in the, in the first book. Each one of those has a different, um, the, the, the y-axis is actually emotional state, right? Each one of those has a different emotional state. I want to start positive, take you to the dark place. I want to feel scared. And so when I tell stories, I'm, I'm managing the emotional side as much as I'm imagine, managing the, the rational side. It's like the horse and rider, uh, the elephant and rider type stuff from the, uh, from the uh, Heath brothers, for example, in their books. Um, that's a loaded, so you want to, so there's a lot, sorry, it's a long answer to a short question, but there's a lot packed into that phrase. Yeah. But the one thing I'd say is when you use a phrase like that, if you use it in a rote fashion, hey, Brent said I should say this, so I'm going to say it, you've already failed. You've got to understand it. That's why I spent some time talking through it. And then you got to mean it. You yeah. got to truly mean it. And all of this comes back to, in my mind, empathy, getting inside your customer's head and understanding not just what do they know, but how do they feel? about what they know. And if you can tap into that and find the right language, this gets into like really cool NLP stuff. I'm not an NLP, a neuro-linguistic programming guy, but I, I, but I know people who are. And you get this NLP stuff, it's super fascinating because it's based in linguistics and like how language choice, actually specific words can change the relationships that you have with humans. So all that, that's all boiled down to and working with other customers like you, one of the things we were surprised to learn is fill that in. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I am an NLP practitioner. And there I, you go. So you know exactly what I'm talking about then. Exactly. Well, look, I, t- I tell you why I love that, that phrase. Yeah. Um, there's t- two reasons I love it. Well, two lenses. Number one, I love it as a, as a customer. Like I've yeah. bought God knows how much software over the years and I love it. I think it's really good. It would, it would pique my interest, number one. Yeah. And B, as you say, it's actually the way it makes me think about you as a trusted advisor. Uh, and second of all, I love it as a salesperson because it's got it's so rich and it's got so much packed into it. And again, I, I know how yeah. to make a customer feel. It also, it, by the way, it lowers the burden on you as a seller, right? Yeah. I don't have to give yourself the permission yeah. Yeah. not to be the expert, right? So so we would literally at CEB put 24-year-olds, 23-year-olds, nothing, this isn't an age thing, but people with right out of uni, right out of college, we'd put them right in front of chief sales officers and, and say, go teach them about their business. Mm-hmm. And there's no way they were ready to do that, except for the fact that they weren't telling what they were thinking. They were sharing the perspective of a hundred other sales leaders and the research that we derived of. So that's that's the phrase they would use, right? Yeah. And and so it, it lowers the burden on you personally to have to be the expert. All yeah. you've got to be is the conduit of really great perspectives. That's the trust piece for me, right? That's the yeah. trust advisor piece is that um, we're, we're always trying to prove our value as, a, as an individual to the prospects. Like we're always trying yeah. to position ourselves as like as an expert, which we should do to a degree. But at the same time, the, the way it works is you're taking the customer by the arm and you're taking them on a journey. And to yep. do that, they've got to trust you. They've got to trust you in that process. And, look, you know, you look at the research that, that, that Matt's done as an example, like some of the stuff in there, it's like, it's so bleeding obvious that yeah, actually right. it's about cultivating trust is ultimately what it is. And that's yeah. the thing about storytelling. Look, the statistics back it up, right? You, you've seen, probably seen the statistics around presentations where people only remember 5% of stats, but they remember 65% of story arcs. It's like, well, yeah. Well, duh, exactly. I mean, like yeah. the cave paintings in, you know, in, in the middle of the, in the middle of the desert that have been there for God knows how many thousands of years. Yeah. We love telling stories, and that's typically how we emote and typically how we connect. And again, that empathy piece again. And I think it's particularly in England I find because when we talk about selling in England, we really talk about selling in London, right? You're right. It's fair. Yeah, it's true. Crammed yeah. into our central business district. Yeah, decisions are made really quickly, and we think it's just about value. Get value. Get value. Get value. It's yeah. Simple. That value is an outcome and value is yeah. to do that. You've got to get buy-in and storytelling is one of the most effective ways of doing it. So it's different in America because you've got four or five hubs, right? And you've got East Coast. Fair. And, Coast yeah. and, and you're also. This, this is where, you know, where this is, a, this, you're going to have to break this up in like two parts and I won't go, but just to give people a heads up, this is what I'm doing now going forward, working at this company called Ecosystems where we're, our whole mission is to help customers and sell, sellers and buyers identify dimensions of value. I'm just going to geek out on this because what you get into is then all sorts of really interesting levels of corporate value, value to the company, professional value, value to me as a person doing my job. But then there's these really interesting things we found in the past called identity value. So value to me as a, as a person and how I perceive myself and all of those different levels of value are at play and, and not just in any one individual at any given point, but then you start thinking about buying groups, then they start yeah. interacting with each other and it gets really complicated. And this is where I'll be geeking out for the next, because I think this is the next thing. This is the next thing of how we're going to differentiate ourselves going forward when thought leadership is kind of played out. 
is, yeah. is having a much deeper understanding of how the physics of value works. So stay tuned on that. Oh, I'm fascinated by that. And I'd love to, once, once you've completed your research and well, yeah. well, well oh, I'll, I'll never complete it. I'll just die, but I get you. Point. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you know more about it, I'd love to talk to you yeah. more about that. And I think hundred uh, percent, it'd be really interesting. And look, I'm, I'm obsessed with what the future of selling looks like, but I just want to sort of end by thanking you. Firstly, thanking you for, for spending time with me today and talking. And I know 100%. that you're going to get a great deal of value from this, but also thank you for the indelible mark that you've left on our industry that deep down we all love and we all care about. And we, all <laughs> we do, don't we? It's, it's sales. Is a, it's a dysfunctional function, but I think they all are, right? It's because we're yeah. human beings, right? It's because we're just freaking human beings, but thank you. It's, I would tell you, um, and I mean this sincerely, it's, it's overwhelmingly humbling. It honestly is. I just, to, to have built a body of work that's had an impact, a material impact on real people's lives is something that I think any one of us as a human being would strive for. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not going to stop checking that box. I'm going to keep trying, but to have at least gotten, you know, a, one opportunity to do that is pretty incredible. Yeah, I agree. I think you should be proud of it as well. You should yeah. be proud of it. Thanks, Ben. Well, if someone wants to get hold of you, if someone wants to learn more about the work you're doing, what's the best way of doing that? Um, easiest probably just on LinkedIn. I post there um, and you can find me there, Brent Adamson. There's there's strangely a few other Brent Adamsons in the world. I'm the one at Ecosystems. Um, I'm also at uh, B Adamson at ecosystems.us. If anyone's interested in talking more about research and communities and creating value and value structures with their customers, um, sign me up. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, uh, but I'm out there on you know, social, beating up people, having fun. I'm I'm kind of tongue in cheek on social, so I've, I'm always poking fun of people. So there you go. I like, so, I, I like following you on LinkedIn. It's always fun. I'll put a link to all your stuff in the uh, in the um, in the description as well. So thank you so much for joining. Thanks, me. Ben.